Thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, I'd like to start off just with a few questions before turning to questions from the audience. Um, and I wanted to begin by talking about your early journey in writing. Um, you moved to Belfast to start writing. Um, and I just wanted to ask, how did the political events of the 80s and 90s in Ireland impact what you wrote? OK, just to set the record straight, I, uh, I moved to Belfast to set my third novel. So I didn't actually start writing there. That would have been peculiar. Um, though more interesting. Uh, I think that uh, moving to Belfast had some influence on my work. It certainly affected the, the novel I uh, set there, Ordinary Decent Criminals, and um, it influenced a, a later book called The New Republic, just because I get, got in on the terrorism game ahead of everyone else, and I, um, I didn't like it. <laughs> unlike a lot of the Guardianistas over here. I was one of the only Americans who spent time there, and I was there for 12 years, who um, uh, developed a real hostility to the IRA. And it doesn't mean that I didn't like the, that, that I had any time for the loyalists either, but I think that was uh, my first experience of really developing my own politics. I was raised in a liberal household in the United States, and uh, curiously, uh, liberals in the U.S. saw the Northern Irish conflict through the prism of a liberation struggle, and it was, and the IRA was seen as, as, as liberal-minded, which it was anything but. And uh, in that I came into the conflict quite innocent of any predisposition. I think that was the first, I was about 29, 30, and it was my first experience of really making up my mind about something myself on the basis of the evidence in my experience. And, you know, that, that influenced uh, my books, but it also uh, meant that it, it gave me some confidence to uh, write journalism, which I have done a lot more of lately. So it, it actually, I would, I would say that that experience was quite formative. Um, and how do you think your writing um, in fiction differs from what you write as a journalist um, after these experiences when you started writing as a journalist? Well, what, what is good about journalism and what is bad about journalism in comparison to writing fiction is they're the same qualities. Uh, clearly especially the kind of comment journalism I do a lot of. It's, it, it's very direct. You can use some indirect devices like satire and, and parody, and, um, but for the most part, it's not a big mystery what you're trying to say, and if it is a big mystery, you've done something wrong. Uh, whereas fiction is much more subtle, it's more evasive, it's more circuitous, it should be a little harder to discern what the message is. Not that it shouldn't have a message, but that, that message is usually complex and sometimes even contradictory. Uh, when you write journalism that is contradictory, it just seems inconsistent and um, poorly thought out. So it, it can be refreshing to to go at something, go at a theme, uh, an opinion, directly and without disguise. But it's not as fun. Um, and which of these, kind of following on from what you said, um, which of these two mediums do you think is more conducive to social change or changing people's minds, especially in kind of the day and age today? Fiction. Definitely. Why, why do you think that specifically? Um, well, first off, I don't think I actually change anyone's mind about anything. So. To, insofar as the, the fiction influences anyone, it's, um, it's probably uh, subtle and um, sneaky. But I think fiction is just more beguiling and more seductive. Whereas most opinion journalism, we were just talking about this in the, the room before this started, most opinion journalism is uh, preaching to the converted. 
people who read The Spectator already agree with it. <laughs> and you know, that's also true of a lot of nonfiction books. They are asking you to be bought by the people who agree with everything in the book already and are just looking to have their viewpoints confirmed and maybe to get a little more ammunition for the next cocktail party. But <laughs> very rarely is an opinion piece going to change somebody's mind. And, you know, that's just one of the depressing facts of the trade. And if, you, if it bothers you, you, don't, you shouldn't do it. Because uh, it it's gratifying to, to tell people things they want to hear. Um, because that's just, that's the way that people are. Every once in a while I force myself to read an opinion piece that I violently disagree with. But it's not that often. And it's unpleasant. Especially when it's well done. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I, 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 I find that writing novels sometimes pushes me to approach a subject with more complexity and with more appreciation for other viewpoints than, than the, the dog dogmatic form of journalism does. And, and therefore, I am pushed to learn something or to, to have a, a larger, uh, more informed viewpoint than I started out with. And that's one of the pleasures of, of writing books. To go back then to what you said about opinion pieces, you said that they kind of exist only to tell people what they already know or already believe. Um, do you think then that these pieces of writing have no value beyond, beyond this kind of um, self-reinforcing um, idea, or do you think that they... Well, I mean, they can, they can um, serve as entertainment, and that's not to be uh, poo-pooed. I love to be entertained. And I love reading uh, good journalism that makes me smile and, um, or is gratifyingly reasoned. I mean, uh, I, I really like people who are funny. Um, not enough of newspapers and magazines are funny these days. The, the world is. <laughs> so, you know, I think I think they may make us think more, you know, journalism may make us think more fully about an issue or bring up some aspects that the readership may not have thought of. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it's not wise to go in there and just expect that um, someone's going to read my column and then um, they're going to vote for Jor Boris Johnson. Right, it's just it's it doesn't work. And before they were rampant Corbinites, it, it, this just does not happen. So it's more it's more like creating a sense of community, right? So that you c connect with other people. And I get it's, it's satisfying sometimes to get letters and emails from people who responded to a particular column strongly. And there is that sense that, that, that it provides the readership of, you know, you are not alone, you also find this stuff absurd, or, um, you know, you have an advocate out there for your position. And, you know, that's, that's a nice feeling to give people. All right, so you've talked about how the language people use around identity politics is wrong in that it stifles creative, um, creative and free thought. Um, could you tell us a bit about your philosophy on this particular aspect? Well, I, I um, recently published a, an essay in Harper's Magazine. Are you referring to this? Yeah. Yes, you found it. Um, <laughs> it's called Lefty Lingo, and it's specifically looking at the language that uh, the hard left has adopted and has been remarkably successful uh, at uh, insinuating into mainstream media outlets and um, the way we talk. It, it wasn't that long ago that we never, we, nobody ever said people of color. And then suddenly everyone says it. It's all over the news, it's all over the newspapers. That's one of the expressions that I take apart because it gets on my nerves. 
I mean, after all, if you say colored people, you get lynched. And there's no difference. And the construction itself is so, uh, you know, archaic. We don't, we don't talk like that. I, 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 and I point out, for example, you know, what does that make everyone else? People of whiteness. Uh, but my biggest objection is not to individual usages, but the fact that this is an entire recognizable lexicon, which when you use it, uh, signals to people uh, uh, of like mind that uh, you're one of them. There's nothing you know, evil about that. Um, and we do that in a way all the time, but this is a very specific kind of signaling. It's like wearing a t-shirt. Um, but it's also used for lazy, lazy thinking and lazy speech. So that you, you use these uh, shorthand expressions like uh, heteronormative and microaggression and, um, and it's a substitute for thinking. And it's certainly a substitute for s speaking in a fresh, original way. So, you know, fundamentally we're talking about jargon, and jargon is always lazy, and it, it makes bad text, and it makes people trying in person. Um, to pick up on the, the kind of particular linguistic distinction you um, referred to, um, and you expressed an issue with the term people of colour mm -hmm. versus what, um, the other term that you used, do you not believe that terms like that <laughs> you always say it have historical baggage that uh, that is significant to acknowledge and therefore these terms need to well, be yes colored people has historical bag baggage therefore if we're going to look for a new word a new term i wouldn't choose people of color do you suggest any alternatives well minorities work fine for me and i don't see why we we replaced it and it covers not only race but also religion and you know a range a, a, and disability a range of 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 groups and i don't know why we suddenly had to come up with a replacement um do you not believe that kind of individual groups within this wider umbrella term that is minorities mm -hmm. deserve recognition um separately? racial minorities <laughs> I, what's wrong with that I just, it's so, it's so straining to avoid colored people by putting that little of in there that it turns the whole, it turns the whole thing into a, a charade. It, it's it, a farce. And, uh, and I don't believe that uh, w we necessarily achieve anything by uh, coming up with a new term. It doesn't change reality a jot. All right, turning now to a slightly different issue. Um, I wanted to talk about, we need to talk about Kevin. Um, <laughs> and I had Sounds like a Raymond Carver <laughs> short story. I have sort of two questions um, on that. Um, I wanted to first talk about the film. Mm -hmm. um, did you think the film did justice to the story? Fundamentally, yeah. I mean, there are a few things I'd do differently. Uh, I thought the red theme was overdone a little. It was a little heavy. So you're nodding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I had a big argument with the director on this. Um, and I would have seen a little more dialogue b because it's a very talky book. And uh, I, I thought the film really picked up when the director used the dialogue from the book and then those fantastic actors. So they really brought out those scenes to life. And I, I noticed that they used those scenes in particular for the preview because they were the ones that really sang. Um, but, you know, in general, there are so many truly terrible films made out of often quite good books that I think I lucked out. And there's one thing you could have changed about the film. Overall, I would have made it less confusing. 
okay? Uh, the book is not hard to understand, and I'm not big on obfuscation. I don't, I, I've become very impatient with fiction that uh, makes the reader's life difficult. Um, it's so much easier to sit in front of the TV that at this stage of the game, it's probably a good idea to make reading as, as, uh, as easy as possible. So I thought that the, the film made it harder to understand what was going on than necessary. And most importantly, I would have established very easily at the, at, at the beginning what the, uh, what the mother did for a living, which I thought was important to how you perceived her experience of suddenly being um, trapped in the house all day with a little kid. And, and she's used to traveling the world. She um, wrote a, I don't know, you, you people are, are way too young to remember Let's Go Europe, but I used, I used it all, uh, biking all over the continent. And um, so I created a, a similar volume as, uh, uh, for my, um, my protagonist. So yeah, I mean, that's a, a broad overall criticism. But again, um, I don't land on the negative. I think, it, I think it's a good film. Um, just a general question about your writing process. Do you think that when you're writing a novel, um, your kind of the message of the novel is key to the planning and um, kind of yeah the planning process? And do you think that your writing is always necessarily a mouthpiece for your views? No, the fiction is not always meant to be a mouthpiece for my views. Um, I know that there are a lot of other novelists who do things differently. There's no formula. I personally tend to plot out a book ahead of time. I find it saves me going up a lot of blind alleys. It doesn't mean I can't change my mind, but it helps to have a, an overall sense of where I'm headed. It's, um, what I don't know in advance is what it means. Um, <coughs> And, you know, because uh, sometimes people say, oh, you know, how can you stand to write a novel if you already know what happens? It, doesn't that take all the fun out of it? Well, th no, because <laughs> first off, when you do have an outline of some sort, <coughs> it's shocking how little that gets you. I mean, are, are any number of you want to be writers or are writers? <coughs> yes? Raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. <laughs> okay, several. Um, even when you have in, a, a clear intention, it's always a shock to sit down to a blank screen and realize that there's a huge gap between wanting to achieve something and even knowing what that is and actually executing it. And of course, in fiction, execution is everything. And it's depressing. It's di disheartening. It's like, oh no, I thought I had it all sorted. Uh-uh. Because it all, it, it all comes down to the sentences, you know, and they have to be good sentences and they have to work right next to each other. Um, and that's always going to be the hard part. So having some kind of skeletal idea of what you're doing is a, it's like a, having a security blanket. Um, but for me, the, the most, the, what's really interesting about developing those sentences and trying to make what I have in the back of my mind actually happen on paper is figuring out, you know, what the book is about. What's the book, what am I trying to say? Why is, why is it better that this book exists in the world rather than doesn't? And that's an important question to ask because there are so many books in the world and none of us will ever read a, a fraction of them. 
And it would, it, it would probably do the human race a favor for everyone just to say, okay, we've written enough books. Let's stop, please, <laughs> right? And of course, that's not gonna happen. But I do think a book has to justify its existence. If you're a writer, if nothing else, it has to justify its existence in your life. That is, it's going to take up a lot of your time, and it needs to be worth your time. And that is the biggest risk of writing novels in particular. I can write a spectator column in the afternoon. It's going to start to finish, and I'm not even all that slow. It's definitely going to take a couple of years to, to finish a book. And if it is a bad idea that doesn't work, it's going to cost me dearly to find that out. But that's the gamble. You just have to have faith. And, you know, I had this problem with my, I have a new book coming out this spring. And it's about the cult of exercise. I wouldn't always have a subject that I can kind of neatly package like that, but it just so happens this book has one of those subjects. And for me, what, what was challenging about writing it was trying to figure out whether it was worth writing about and wondering if maybe this is kind of a small subject and why, why, is, it, why is this worth addressing and why is, does it seem pressing now? And by the end of it, I decided, yeah, it is a worthy subject matter. It ended up touching on aging and, and mortality and, um, and the meaning of life. I mean, I, I, th this is something that seems to have consumed uh, both young and old. Uh, it's been going on for 20 years, and, and it only gets worse. And people are really rating themselves more, often more than anything on how much exercise they get, you know? And, it, and, and the, what the expectations of, of what counts as, as uh, really exerting yourself keeps going up. And this is interesting. It is interesting. But I didn't completely convince myself that it was interesting until the book was over. <laughs> Great. On that note, we will turn to questions from the audience. So if you do have a question, put your hand up and a microphone should come to you. We will go to the hand in the back, in the blue jumper. Hi. Hi, thanks very much for your talk. Um, I just found it interesting how you say that um, obfuscation is not what you aim for when you're writing fiction and that you don't like it when authors do that. Um, I recently read Big Brother mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, I just wondered how that ties in with that approach to writing fiction because that's a book where, towards the end, the whole understanding of whether the events in the book are even real, or you can't trust the narrator anymore. I just mm. wondered how um, your aversion to obfuscation ties in with that. What I don't like is for the reader not to know what's going on, and I especially don't like the reader not to get going, not to be confused about what's going on, and let me rephrase. See, that was confusing. Um, <laughs> Any confusion should be deliberate, okay? Uh, what you're talking about at the end of Big Brother is, it's a fictional device. It's a, and I'm not quite sure what you call it besides pulling the rug out from under your reader, which is really fun. Um, and you could call it manipulative, but, um, a student remarked um, half an hour ago that all fiction is manipulative, and that was quite astute. Um, what, you sh what I would encourage you to avoid is being unclear in an accidental way or being, being confusing for the sake of it and not to a purpose. Uh, and, al and always bear in mind that your reader is impatient. So if you're going to use confusion, you'd better, doing, you'd, better do it, you'd better be feeding them something very compelling so that 
they desperately want to find out what it is they don't understand. Uh, and that's a dangerous thing to do because readers don't like to feel stupid. And if you make your reader feel stupid for very long, they're going to go find a book that makes them feel smart. <laughs> but that was a good question. Um, if we go to the hand in the front row, just here. Uh, so hi, I was wondering, um, so your book, The Mandibles, takes quite a radical viewpoint on American politics in the future, um, and it's quite a near future. I was wondering what your current viewpoints on the political climate right now is, especially uh, as the election is coming up, and there aren't actually that many people of color running um, this time around. So yeah, I was wondering what your viewpoint on that is. By the way, on that of color thing, it's a losing battle. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I just, fine. <laughs> well, I've never m m made any bones about the fact that I can't stand Trump, and that just makes m me fit in with the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, <laughs> I am, uh, I don't feel complacent about 2020. I have been heartened by the fact that um, the moderates in, in the Democratic primary seem to be getting some traction. <coughs> so it's not just Biden who, you know, along with, again, you know, everyone else, I'm kind of lukewarm on, uh, but I would certainly back him over the more left-wing candidates because I think that those are the people that Trump really wants to run against. Uh, I thought that was absolutely fascinating that Pete Buttigieg is now nine points ahead in Iowa. I was just floored. That happened really fast. And, you know, I don't think he has much experience, but neither did Obama. Um, he's very uh, articulate and seems pretty thoughtful and not too extreme. I don't know whether he could beat Trump or not. You know, that's definitely the standard. Uh, otherwise, uh, um, I wish Michael Bloomberg had gotten into the race a little earlier if he was going to do it at all. So I, I'm not sure whether he can make up for lost time. But I, I really hope that the Democrats nominate someone moderate. It is overwhelmingly important to get that guy out of the White House. I think, I think he's a little crazy. I, I do mean demented I th um, and genuinely dangerous. Um, and I, I find him dangerous because of his erratic quality and his incompetence and his inability to um, focus on anything or learn anything or consult people who know what they're talking about even if he doesn't. Uh, much more than um, his being uh, a malign force. I actually think incompetence is more dangerous. Uh, so I'm, I'm anxious. I mean, I, I wrote the mandibles before he was elected. In fact, I wrote it before he even started running. And um, it was interesting. I wouldn't call that book precisely uh, you know, prescient. It, um, it's talking about an economic collapse, which of course Trump has helped make more likely by getting the United States a trillion dollars in debt more every year. That's astonishing. Um, but it doesn't foretell a character like Trump. But it was interesting that once he was elected, um, the U.S. Uh, fiction reading public became obsessed with reading dystopic fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why either. They were living dystopic fiction. So why did they need it? If we go to the hand just there. Um, 
Thank you, and thank you very much for coming to speak to us. Um, I read an article of, your, of yours once where you described yourself as a, a newsaholic. Um, mm. So how do you find, um, in a time as noisy um, as ours, um, how do you find the ability to sort of focus in on what's really important, especially when it comes to reading and writing? Well, I don't always. Um, I mean, that piece was confessional. It, it made me feel guilty because when I add up how much time I spend consuming news in some fashion, I don't understand how I get anything else done. Um, and it is a, an addiction. And I, th I think that I bought into this notion that if you're reading or watching the news, then that is ipso facto a, a, a good use of your time. You know, it's, it's productive. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. A lot of this stuff is utter rubbish. And uh, I, I got into a habit a while ago. We always get the Saturday Guardian and I discovered that reading it a w week later was incredibly clarifying. There were all these articles that had been overtaken by other events. I didn't have to read them. And yet, th the, the articles that were actually of substance, of, of some enduring meaning, talking about a big, a big subject, they read fine, right? So what it did is it, it, it strained out all the stuff that I'd forget anyway and is a complete waste of time. And then what was left was what was meaningful, what was truly interesting, what, what was of enduring importance. It's fascinating. Only one week just gets rid of about two-thirds of the newspaper. I thought that was kind of shocking, but a real revelation. Um, so, I mean, if I, if, I, if I really valued my time, I would be much more disciplined about how much news I consume. It's a, it's a, it's a lazy habit. You know, I, wa I, I watch Newsnight and the Channel 4 News every night. I mean, if it, it ends up being like years of my life. <laughs> no, Jon Snow is not deserving of that. Not even Emily Maitlis, God <laughs> bless her. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's, uh, it can obscure as much as it clarifies to be inundated with all that information. And it, I think one of the dangers of it is, is presentism, which is getting so immersed in the now uh, that you don't have perspective on it, you know? You don't step back and, s and, and watch what's happening uh, in a way that, that, that sees larger trends and movements and you just get lost in the little stuff and it makes you stupid. If we go just there. Um, if you could stand up, we'll ask you a question. Um, so obviously you've been a fairly outspoken critic of political correctness culture, um, but some of the ways you're talking about writing and literature uh, implies that you kind of almost feel that you're in competition with other things people could be doing with their time entertainment-wise, like TV and things like that. Um, and I'm wondering if that maybe combined with uh, the first thing um, gives you a sense that we have a cultural crisis or not, and um, if so or not, why? I don't know whether we are in a cultural crisis. That's one of those things that it's difficult for me to achieve any perspective on. You know, we read all the time a reference to the culture wars, and there's a way in which they've been going on for a long time, I mean, ever since the 1960s, though they've changed. Um, I am not convinced that this so-called war is uh, anything but a kind of low-level entertainment. Um, there are sometimes real things at stake, like people's jobs, and I think that's where it really matters. Uh, but as a conversation, it strikes me as very first world, 
and indulgent. Uh, and the people who are carrying on the identity politics stuff, uh, who, are, who are perpetuating more than anyone, always talking about privilege, it's mostly white people. It's mostly white, well-off people who, who are promoting this ideology. Now, I've, I've, I think, or I have thought anyway, that it's worth pushing back against because I, it's a way of thinking about people that I find retrograde and um, reductive. So, you know, I don't want to think of myself as a, as a uh, white female American, and that's the end of it. Um, and I don't want to think of others in those categories either. Uh, it's flattening, and certainly for a fiction writer, it's just, what have you got? It's, it's like the end of character. Um, but I'm, a, I'm ambivalent about having been seduced into fighting this battle a lot, you know, in the columns and, and um, also in events like this one. And I'm not convinced it's n not a waste of my time. Uh, some of the concepts that I find myself uh, fighting, like cultural appropriation, are so transparently stupid that I feel that I have, I have lost the fight by fighting it, if you know what I mean. That is, when, when someone entices you to squander your time and your energy on an argument that isn't worth having, they've won even if you triumph, <laughs> right? So I'm beginning to get a little ambivalent about writing about this stuff. It's become compulsive, but it's a bit of a trap. If we go to the lady in the gray jumper. Thank you. Um, so playing off of what you playing off of what you just said, mm -hmm. um, and about sort of different purposes of fiction and journalism. Why write, why write opinion pieces if you believe that they're not going to change anyone's mind? Is it purely for the entertainment of people who are like-minded? And if so, why use what people would say is quite inflammatory rhetoric, quite contradictory ideas? Why, you know, why make entertainment something that is offensive to others? But it's not offensive to my central readership. Uh, and if you're offended by my journalism, A, you don't have to read it. And uh, B, other people aren't. Maybe, maybe, you're, maybe that doesn't make you the ideal target audience for that piece. I mean, I, I do not, by the way, set out to offend people on purpose. It, it just happens. Um, <laughs> Because I, I don't, it is my nature, I don't pull my punches, and I definitely don't stop myself from making a joke. Um, and that's actually where I get myself into the most trouble, is when I'm being funny. And, uh, and I'm probably just going to keep on doing that. Um, but I think we addressed that pretty fully, you know, a little earlier in this, that it's, it's not, the form of the comment piece is, is, is as if to persuade, but it really is a much more collusive form than that. And it's all about, you know, the ni I think the nicest spin you can put it on it is, the, is that it's about an ideological community. And the one thing I will say, and I don't take advantage of this as often as I might, but uh, once you have that community, every once in a while, it's possible to go out on a limb and take an, an unusual position, a position that your fellows wouldn't necessarily expect you to take, and they'll go with you. They'll go with you because you've, you've been one of the faithful for all this time, and you're saying something a little weird, and they'll think about it. So it, it, it does mean carving out a, a power to sometimes make a point 
that's going to pull, maybe not persuade someone to completely go on the other side of something, but to pull them a little bit this way. And, you know, on, in terms of having an effect on other people, that's about as much as you can ever expect. Great. Um, if we go to the lady in the grey jumper over there. Um, so at some points in We Need to Talk About Kevin, I think some of the characters express um, a belief about school shootings, which, like, they kind of pertain towards a gimmicky or copycat or trend-led uh, aspects of those pieces of violence. Um, and considering some of the themes of We Need to Talk About Kevin are so eternal, like the challenges of motherhood, the bravery of motherhood, could you ever have expected when you originally published that book that... Um, American violence and American violence in schools would be a such horrendously enduring theme that's still relevant today. I have to say I am shocked that school shootings are still an issue in American uh, schools. I just, I expected that book to eventually become anachronistic and it, and uh, I think that if I was actually a little worried. This doesn't sound good. That's why I, why I was hesitating. But I'll say it anyway. <laughs> Self-destructive. Um, before publication, I was a little frustrated that there wasn't another, you know, big school shooting. I, I needed, I needed some uh, peg for my book. And I was a little worried that it, the whole thing was played out, and therefore I wouldn't sell any copies. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> to at least my faux despair, um, that has not proved the case. Now, I actually went through a period of um, be careful what you wish for, because after Kevin came out, and especially once it became a bestseller here, every single time there was another one of these incidents, I got inundated with requests to write features and write opinion pieces and go on the news and go on the radio. And it was kind of cool at first, but not for very long. Uh, for one thing, one of the reasons they would drag me on to these uh, news programs is that nobody else knew what to say. That's the trouble with these incidents, like what do you say? And there, there, were, there was a while there that we had this handful of lessons we were supposed to learn, but they, they're kind of limp and lame and they didn't last very long and we kept, come, you know, like, oh, we, 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 we have to stop bullying in the schools, you remember that one, or look out for the warning signs. Um, but ultimately, they just, if you, if you were really going to inhabit these events, then they left you speechless because there was nothing to say. They are so pointless. They're just, they're, they're, they're all bad, right? And it's interesting about things that are all bad. It's almost impossible to comment on them. The, the problem is the lack of complexity. It's just a dumb, awful thing that kids do, that sometimes adults do too, and it shouldn't happen. And it, uh, so this whole thing of being put in position all the time, of having to fill in where basically the newscasters have no idea what to say about this stuff, and then they put me up there, and it's like, all right, what does it mean? Um, one of the only things that I ended up f filling the minutes with on TV was saying, well, you know, one of the main reasons that these uh, young men, it's always young men, uh, start planning these events is that they want attention. And sometimes even, even posthumous attention will do. It's, uh, they want to be known. They want to be recognized. After all, that's the kind of culture we live in now. Everyone wants to be the center of attention. It's awkward because everyone being in, in the center of attention is difficult to arrange. Um, 
So, you know, I would observe that the very newscasts that I was appearing on were part of the problem, that we constantly provide the attention that the culprits are seeking. And the greater coverage these incidents get, the more incentive we give for uh, equally uh, maladjusted young men to do the same thing. But you know, then I had to start catching myself on because there I was doing what I said we weren't supposed to do. And that didn't make any sense. So after I said that on the news enough times, I took my own advice and I started churning all these invitations down. Great, any other questions? If we go to the hand right over there in the corner. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your words. I wanted to know when you write a book, do you target a specific audience? For example, for um, the Kevin book, do you, did you target a specific um, uh, age rate or um, did you have a political message or something that you wanted to change in society in general in, with that book? No. No. I mean, I. Almost all writers uh, write to please themselves. There are, there are certain genres. If you're writing in that genre, you're writing young adult books, yes, you are deliberately targeting a young adult audience. And um, you know, I guess people who write mysteries are familiar with their audience. Um, and, and, but, for, but if you're writing literary fiction, it's you don't really picture an audience. Um, I don't think it's useful. I'm my audience. Um, so I, and I, I, I don't think, I think that in the editing phase, it's always valuable to, to the best of your ability, pretend to be somebody else when you're reading through it. Try to make yourself naive to your own text. That's very hard to maintain, by the way, because you suddenly get sucked back into it and become complacent and self-congratulatory. <laughs> um, reading your text from the viewpoint of somebody else is actually quite frightening. Uh, I can now do that with some of my earlier books because I don't sit around reading my own work all the time. So I, if I take out, you know, a stray page in my second novel, I can now read it as if I didn't write it. And it, it is frightening because you, it's, you bring a coldness to it that is it, hard to take. And if there's anything wrong with it, it's obvious <laughs> and painful. Um, if we just go to the hand in the Navy. If I could bring us to uh, UK politics. Um, if you could ask Boris Johnson and uh, Jeremy Corbyn one question to which you knew they would give a truthful answer, uh -huh. oh. what would that question be? Are we really leaving the European Union? <laughs> Yeah, I still don't know. <laughs> Great, any other questions at all? Yes, just in, if we go right to the back. Just a quick question, perhaps a slightly lighter question, or maybe not. Um, is there one book that you wish uh, you had written um, it could be a favourite book, could be not a favourite book necessarily, but yeah, what's one book that you wish you had written? Mm. I would love to have written Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton. It's a masterpiece. Um, I would have loved to have written any of her books, actually. She's a terrific stylist. But apropos of that confusion discussion we were having, I don't mean fancy or hard to understand. She's very clear and just beautiful and often quite simple and direct, but she was a master of characterization 
and her prose is beautiful without being poncy. And, um, and it's a heartbreaking story that makes you cry. What more do you want? We have time for one final question. And if we just go to the hand over there in the fourth row. Just in keeping with your views on identity politics, um, what do you think about sensitivity readers and how have they affected the industry? Thus far, sensitivity readers have been primarily used by the young adult fiction. Um, and I am leery of the practice spreading to mainstream fiction. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing your homework, by the way. and if you're writing about someone who's very different from yourself or has ex an experience, a kind of experience that you, you haven't personally, then I'm all for um, doing all kinds of research if, if it helps. But uh, I don't like the idea of essentially subjecting manuscripts to the purity police. It's one of the problems with the sensitivity readers. They're self-nominated. And I don't, you know, for example, I, I'm not sure I would want to be put in a position to say, well, are women going to find this offensive? To read books and saying, uh, you know, on, on behalf of women, uh, do we, do, does this misre misrepresent women? Well, how do I know? I'm just one woman. And that's one of the problems with the whole concept of the sensitivity reader, is that supposedly, if you're black or disabled, your, your experience stands in for everyone's. Well, I, I pretty much reject that. Uh, it also naturally leads to homogenization and uh, from, from the author's perspective, cowardice, because, I mean, you wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of your sensitivity reader. And I, I, um, I am, of course, I, on record as advocating that fiction writers get less fearful and less uh, obsessed with whether or not they're going to be hurting somebody's feelings. It's not as if we don't have plenty of um, opportunities uh, to make our voices heard if uh, someone writes a, a book that, uh, that we consider misrepresentative or offensive or whatever. You know, there's good reads in Amazon and then social media. And then, but I don't like the institutionalization of this process of combing through a manuscript to see if, you know, if there's any special group out there who might be bothered by one deal, detail or another. It, you know, I, I, I think it's creepy. Great. I think that is all we have time for today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Lionel Shriver. Thank you.